few weeks ago, we began a series called What If? And our goal was to, uh, to get you to ask the tough questions, that uh, what if question in your own life, so that later on in life you could end up avoiding the if only kind of regrets. The regrets that say, if I had only taken a chance, if I'd only changed jobs, if I had only opened my own business, if I had only... And we want to help you to avoid those kinds of regrets. And that's what we're talking about today specifically is what if. And today I, I want to talk directly to the fact, directly to the topic. What if you partnered with God? What if you partnered with God? Bow your heads with me for a word of prayer this morning. Jesus, help us to focus in on your word this morning. Lord, there are individuals in the room today that they, they need to hear something specific from you. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will speak directly to each individual life today. As I preach, Lord, let your word go directly into the hearts and in the minds of each individual in a way they need to hear it, God. Open up our minds to comprehend our spirits to receive your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. On May the 25th, 1961, President John F. Kennedy stood before the Congress there and he began to talk about something way out there in the distance, something far out and something crazy. And that was that we would put a man on the moon before the end of the decade and return him safely back to the house. Yeah. So I, I know that some of you are thinking today that was a really good Hollywood production uh, that they did. They didn't actually put a man there. Some of you conspiracy theorists in the room. But it, that dream happened, and it, it, uh, it, it ended up with this one phrase from Neil Armstrong that, was, that is kind of remembered by everybody, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. On July 20th, 1969, within the decade that he promised that we would be able to do that. So we believe that the tipping point for that was this bold prediction that the president made. We are going here. Just so everybody knows, that's what he's saying. Just so everybody knows, we are going here, and we're going to bring them back here. Because that's kind of an important part, at least for the family, you know. Um, a few weeks ago, I, I also mentioned to you about Henry Ford's dream. He dreamed of being able to put a, an affordable, quality vehicle in, in the hands of every family across the land. See, up until that point, the uh, cars had only been able to be afforded by the very rich. Uh, and a lot of people that were, that were not real rich didn't even see a, a kind of a, a real need for that. Um, visionary leaders see things that need to happen before they happen. Before the individuals even know what they need. It's like you as a parent. You know what your kids need even though they don't believe they need that. It's uh, maybe, a, maybe a better way to say it is, is, is. Did anybody in here hate high school? Can I see your hand? You hated high school? Okay, you, a few of you guys. Maybe junior high. Did you hate junior high? Yeah, yeah. So it's, 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 it's the kind of thing that goes like this where you think all I need to do as a student is get out of this place. Whatever it takes to get out of this prison, that's what I am going to do. And a teacher sees past you just getting out of that school. The teacher sees that what you really need five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years from now, you need an education. You don't need to just get out. Teacher has a vision for your future before you have a vision for your future. 
It's quoted of Henry Ford as, as saying this, if, if I had asked the people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. What, do you, would you like a car? No, I just need a faster horse. Um, so he realized the need for the vehicle before they realized the need for the vehicle. Jesus is the leader of this, his church. Jesus sees what we need before we know that we even need it. So in, in, in following him and his direction, we need to recognize he sees things from a heavenly perspective that we don't see. He sees our future and he knows what, our, what we have needs of before we even recognize that we have a need for that thing. So there was a story in Matthew 16. If you got your Bible and you want to turn there, Matthew 16, verse number 13. It's a story there where Jesus is entering the region of Caesarea Philippi. He's talking to his disciples and he, he asked them this. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now let me time out and just tell you right there. This is a time period where Jesus is, is ministering. And every little place that they go to, they kind of have a different perspective. He'll go to some places and they, they're like, you, you got to get out of here. You, got to, you have to leave. Uh, you're scaring us to death. You have to leave. And there's other places where they are receiving him. And they're open to him. So he's asking his disciples, who do the people around here in this area that we just walked into, who do these people think that I am? What, how are they receiving my message? Verse number 14 says, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. They're not really sure. They're saying good things though, right? Then... He, he turned this on his disciples, the guys that had been with him now for a while. And he asked his disciples this question that each individual in this room has to ask and answer themselves as well. And he said this, verse 15, but what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? I believe our answer to that question, or maybe how we answer that question, really determines what we do day to day and how we do what we do. Because I, some people would answer it like, I believe Jesus is, you know, he's a good guy. He's a great guy. He's, he's like rock star kind of good person. And yet do nothing about it and others have a passion they believe Jesus is the son of God and they have a passion to do something with what they know to reach people so he said this in verse verse 16 says this it says Simon Peter answers you are the Messiah the son of the living God now, I don't know how exactly how he said it, if they were just over here having coffee. And he says, uh, yeah, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, oh, cool. But if, 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 if I'm reading it the way that I think that it says, he, st he stands up from the coffee table. You are the Messiah. He's got a little preach in his voice. You know what I'm talking about? Where you have that, uh, at the end of your words. You are the Messiah. The son of the living God. That was a bold declaration, a bold statement that he's making there as to, I know exactly who you are. You are God's son. You are the promised Messiah that we've heard about all of our lives. And our parents heard about all of their lives. And their parents heard about all of their lives. And generations after generation above us heard about you are the one that was supposed to come, and now you are here. That's what he's saying right there in that. That's what is wrapped up in that one word, Messiah. You are the Savior that was promised to come here. Verse 17, Jesus 
says this. Wow. Not really. He didn't say wow, but that's really what he's thinking. It says, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father, which is in heaven. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Now there's a little bit of controversy about that one verse. Jesus is changing his name. Jesus is changing Simon's name to Peter. He's saying, because you understand things on a greater level, because God has revealed them to you on a greater level, because you have this boldness, Jesus says, I, I'm changing your name to, to Rock, or Rocky, if you will. And he for sure had a Rocky type personality. You know, after that one statement, I've seen him marching up the steps in Philadelphia and raising his hands up like this. You know, he's got that Rocky type personality, that strong, aggressive, testosterone infused type personality for sure. Jesus says, I'm changing your name to Rock or Cephas, a, a part of the Rock, as some people would interpret that. And and some churches believe that Jesus is saying here, I'm going to build my church upon you, the rock. Um, if, that was the, if that was the true case, we would have seen Peter being the foremost leader in the church as it continued through history. But it, it doesn't continue that way. What Jesus is saying there, and you can, you can see it in a simple nuance. I, I was there standing in, at the at, at this spot in Israel, and our, our guide, which had lived there and understands the language and everything, he said, it's, it's explained in a simple nuance. And Peter, Jesus is not saying, I'm going to build my church on you, Peter, the rock. He said, call them Cephas, or a part of the rock, a part of the foundation if you will. And he's saying this. I'm going to build my church upon this rock. Not you, the rock. Me, the rock. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. Jesus is the foundation of everything we are and everything we do. It's about Jesus. It's not about Peter. It's about Jesus. G Peter is, was great. And his statement here is a statement that each and every one of us need to make. We need to come to the point where we say, I, I, not only do I believe that, but I will act upon that. I will follow you, Jesus. I will follow you, Jesus. And it's upon that truth right there that the church is built. Not just upon Jesus, but the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. The one that was to come, that came, and that is the son of the living God. It's on that truth that our church is built. And we as Christians, we are the church. It's upon the truth that Jesus is the son of God, the Messiah, the savior of the world. And it goes on, the verse goes on to say, just simply, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is saying, I will build my church, and hell cannot do anything about it. I'm going to build my church. Now, is Jesus talking about a building there? No. No, he's not talking about a building. He's talking about people. He's talking about us. What is referred to as the bride of Christ. The church is referred to as the bride of Christ. Um, Jesus took a... a a rough, tough group of, of fishermen and tradesmen and tax collector, at least one tax collector that we know of, and he turned them into his disciples. And it was these disciples that ended up changing the whole wide world and the way that we do everything that we do. Now, I know that each of us have our own heroes and things like that. One of my, I guess, the icons that, uh, that I look to and I would say is a hero of mine 
are, are different people that are visionary leaders. One of those visionary leaders is Walt Disney. I know you expected me to say some great church person somewhere and some theological leader somewhere. Yeah, I have those as well, but I love Walt Disney. I love the Disneyland, and I love the Disney World, and I love the Disney this and the that, and all of the Disney movies. I love those, except for like Witch Mountain things like that. I don't like those kind of the scary ones. <laughs> I love the Disney stuff. I love Walt Disney. He said this. He said, all of our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. And... Uh, Walt was a good example of a, of a visionary leader for sure. So he had the vision to have these massive theme parks that would entertain children and families and be family fun for everybody. And he died five years before the, uh, the Disney World in Florida was completed. And on opening day in 1971 at Disney World, almost five years after, Five years after he, Walt Disney had died, uh, they, they opened that facility there. And someone commented to Mike Vance, which was the creative director at uh, Walt Disney Studios. And they said, isn't it too bad that Walt Disney didn't live to see this place? Isn't it too bad? And Mike Vance simply re replied, he did see it. That's why it's here. He did see it. That's why it's here. Um, Walt knew that the world had a need for family fun and entertainment, wholesome entertainment, before the world recognized that they had a need for family fun, wholesome entertainment. And his vision really did impact the world. I mean, it, it impacted the whole wide world. Jesus saw the need that we would have on a much higher level. And Jesus had a vision uh, that would uh, bring life through his disciples to the rest of the world. Think about this group. They're, they're probably not a group that you would have put together or I would have put together. Fisherman, tax collector, tradesman, and Jesus says, I want y'all, You, uh, this is going to be great. Pulls those ragtag group of guys together and changes the world with that group of people. I, I wanted to point to the fact that, that Jesus didn't call those that were seemingly qualified. Jesus calls people and then he qualifies them. He teaches you. And also some of you may be sitting here today and, and thinking there's not a whole lot of hope for you. You don't have that, or you don't have the talent, or the giftings, or anything. You need to understand that, that Jesus is not necessarily looking for those things. That we say all the time he's looking for three things. He's looking for fat people. Faithful, the F stands for faithful. The A stands for available. And the T stands for teachable. Teachable. I know some of you are thinking, really, how large do I have to be? For Jesus to start looking at me because I'm feeling pretty big right now. We say it that way so you can remember it. Faithful, available, and teachable is what the Lord is looking for. So I'm asking you today to ask yourself the question, what if you partnered with God? What if you followed his lead the way that the disciples followed his lead? I know this. That if your dream doesn't scare you, it's not a God-sized dream. If your dream does not scare you, it's not a God-sized dream. So, I'm asking you if, if you are willing to pursue it. If you're willing to, to take the necessary steps, to make, take a, a leap, if you will, of faith to achieve that God-sized dream. Understand this, at the end of your life, if you make it to heaven, well, it's a what if series, so <laughs> let's pretend what if you make it to heaven. 
You're not going to stand before God and hear God say, you had a great plan. Wow, what a dream. That was really neat. The way you laid it all out on paper and you graphed it and everything like that, it's really, really cool. You won't stand before God and hear God say, you know that idea that was in the back of your head? That idea that, you know, that it was a really cool idea, way to think that thought. Scripture teaches us the way that Jesus will respond is by saying, well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in to your reward. Not well thought out, not well planned, not well envisioned, well done. See, I think a lot of people have great intentions, but they don't follow that up with great actions. Oh, I, I didn't expect you to say amen right there, because that's a hard one. For, it's a hard pill to swallow there, I can tell you. So, I want to take a moment today and share with you a little bit of the vision that the Lord has given me for this church, for us, for you. And that is this. As we've talked through this with the elders, the staff, the leaders of the church, we've come to four things that we feel like the Lord is directing us towards. And it is going to require you to not just believe it, but you to be a doer in it. The first one is this, that we believe that God is calling our church to grow. To grow. And what that means is it, it, it's not just numerically, but numerically is a part of it. We need to grow spiritually. We need to grow relationally we need to grow numerically we need to grow financially for us to get where God is calling us to we need to grow and the good news is is that we have a vision of where we're headed the bad news is that it's going to require you doing something I, this is a good time for you to turn to your neighbor and say he's talking specifically straight to you right now could you turn to turn to the I am if you think I'm calling you out, I am calling you out. Don't make me start calling names. I'm talking to every Danny, you don't have anybody next to you. I'm talking to you too. Everybody. I'm calling you out. So a part of the growth here has really been happening spiritually. But then we get to seasons like summer and people are traveling and out. And so... You know, September and October, attendance has been up and down, and it's been crazy. People that are never late for anything have been late. Like, you're almost missing worship. The best part of the service. Don't, don't agree with that. Do not agree with that. Do not. A part of growth... Is getting up. A part of growth is not staying out late on Saturday night so you can get to church on time on Sunday morning. That's just good preaching. I, I know. I'm, I know you don't like it, but that's good stuff. I know you could go to any other church today in town and they just say, I'm glad that you're here. And we are. We're thrilled that you're here. But Jesus, you see, He accepts you just like you are. He loves you just like you are. But He loves you too much to leave you that way. He loves you too much to leave you that way. And, that, and that's what I feel for you. I feel that God wants to grow every single individual in this place, including me. God wants to grow us all spiritually, relationally, uh, our size, numerically, and, and financially. One of the next things we need to do as we go into the spring is we need to go to two services. We need to go to like a 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock service. Some of you don't like coming 1030. You're thinking hallelujah for the 11 o'clock service. And others of you that are morning people, you would like to be here at 9 and, nine and out. Get it? That'd be great. Have the rest of your day. That'd be great. Show of hands here, okay? This is not, you're not committing to your for your spouse, you personally, how many of you would prefer a 9 o'clock service? Raise your hand. Okay, put your hands down. How many of you prefer an 11 o'clock service? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. 
What I didn't say is the 11 o'clock service also goes to 2. It's from 11 to 2. I'm just, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So. The next thing that I believe that God has called us to, besides growing in, in, in our practical things, like getting to church on time, being here faithful and regular, faithful, available, teachable, getting there, not just doing that, the next thing I believe God is calling us to is, is to, as we grow financially, that we'll be able to have a full-time staff here. Did you know that I am the only full-time paid person here at the church? I'm the only one staff member that's paid full-time to be here. Now, we have these other staff members that they mentioned, and they're, these are people that are working on, on church stuff or helping you in some way every day. That's why we call them the staff. And that's, those are people that are meeting with us and doing all the planning stuff all of the time. And I'm so grateful for them. But as we grow... We need people that are working on that full time, that their time's not having to go uh, away to work and make a living and stuff like that. So we want to add full time paid and full time volunteer people as well as we continue to grow. The third thing is, is that the Lord's given us a, a, a vision for is to build church facilities that will grow with our, our congregation and our community. So uh, we have a lot of property, and I'm going to show you that in just a minute. I'm going to show you some pictures of what, where we're headed towards. But we really believe that, that that will help us to reach more people in our community, not just because of size, but because of, of the, we're going to be up closer to the road and the visibility and the change that's going to be there. We've done a lot of changes to this building. Uh, those of you that weren't here a few years ago, you could, you could uh, a few years ago, it was just a white building, no landscape, no paint, no, uh, no banners, nothing. nothing. Um, when asked, people said it looked like we might handle snakes inside. Uh, we didn't. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's, so we've updated the facility as good as we can update it. Now it's time for a new one. And the, the fourth thing that we want to do, not as a fourth thing along the way, but Fourth thing in progression, but fourth thing along the way is we want to plant churches and ministries like our Spanish church that has been planted in the other building that meets over there on Sunday nights. It's going and doing good. So like that, we want to be a part of planting churches and ministries ongoing. So let me take a moment real quick and, and share with you our, our vision for this facility that I'm talking about. Um, the first picture I want to show you here is of the property as is. And so, that I know that's a little difficult to see here, but we are in the building off to the uh, top right there. That's our sanctuary building. You can look at this on Google Earth and see that the building below it there is our, our kids' building there. That's Spring Cypress below us there. We own from this street all the way over to the other street. We own those three large warehouses over there that you see on the left-hand side of this picture. And I want to show you a, our master plan, what we want to go towards as we build towards the future. Go ahead and show the ne next slide there. So what this shows here is a new sanctuary complex over on the front corner of our property, taking in the two warehouses that are there in the front, building a parking lot out on the corner of Spring Cypress and Cedar Edge Drive, and... Uh, pathway across and park environment between our children's building and our new sanctuary building there. Well, let's zoom in to the sanctuary building and show you what that could look like. This is a preliminary drawing of what that could look like. Uh, these two buildings here, one at the top left, bottom left, are buildings that are already there. They're warehouse spaces we would renovate. Making the bottom left half of the uh, lower building here nursery. And then uh, the right-hand side of that foyer, and it would lead into a large hallway that would lead into a, a sanctuary building that's, that's on a corner shape here. That uh, the sanctuary and the, uh, would, would be able later on to add a balcony to that. This sanctuary building would seat about 500 people. And, um, and then, then we would be able to build a balcony that would seat some more people. Our vision, just so you understand, 
has nothing to do with the size of the church. It has to do with the lostness of the community. Um, you know, there's a reason why McDonald's will tear down an old building and build a new one that looks the same right in the same spot. Because new people will start coming to that McDonald's. The sales will go through the roof just by having a new facility there. So we know that if we, when we are able to get towards this, we know that this will reach more people in our community. And um, there's a, I have a couple of pictures of what that building could look like. Here's the first one from the, uh, from the right-hand side. The taller building there would be the building that, that you see here on the right would be the, the building that we would be adding. And the building you see to the left-hand side is the original uh, warehouse building there that's got a new face on it, new front on it. And show them from this, the other perspective, from that side, from the left-hand side, this you would see this being the, kind of the main entrance where the glass is there. You would go in and turn left, and that would be all of our nursery classrooms there. And you would, the, the, where the glass is would be a big foyer area, and you would turn to the right to get into the sanctuary building over there. That is also expandable. So I know that dreams and visions take time to develop. Um, they just really, they really do. We're on a track towards that. Uh, I was reminded about that this week when I, I was flipping through the channels. I was actually waiting on Joe to come over and, and I was flipping through the channels and uh, a movie was on was Rudy. And this football movie, and I, I don't, I've seen bits and pieces of it for, through the years, but I was actually glad that Joe was late for once because uh, I was able to watch the end of Rudy. And um, in that movie, you got the, this young man that wants to, he dreams of one thing, getting to Notre Dame to play football. And he's getting rejection letter after rejection letter uh, year after year, and he can't even get in there. So then he, he finally gets in, and he doesn't. He doesn't really have a chance to get on the football team. He's so small. But he is a fighter, and he keeps, he keeps working at it. And, and as the movie goes along, and the true story goes along, he keeps working at it. And uh, by the, the end of his senior season, the, um, he had never been able to dress out for a game and even be on the sidelines. And the team steps up to the coach and they individually come to the coach and give their jersey and say, Coach, let him play for me this week. And, and obviously the coach can't do that, but the coach is like, okay, I'll let him sit on the sidelines. But stand on the sidelines. And every individual on in the team is, is for him getting to do this. And then they, they don't just stop there. By, by the, towards the end of the game, they want him to be able to get into the game, to play a play. And... Uh, Sure enough, they, they did that, and the coach allowed him to get in there, and he gets a tackle, and the players carry him off on their shoulders. It's a true, true story, and, and as, as, far as, the, the, um, as far as when the movie was made, that, that's the last time they had carried anybody off into the locker room on their shoulders was this guy that played a one or two plays in their college game that shouldn't even have been there but had the heart and the stick to itiveness to go after his dreams. See, that's the problem, is people dream big dreams, but they won't follow through with what has to get done to get it done, to get to see the dream happen. It takes this stick to that happens there. And, and you see, what happens in life is we have setbacks, and we give up at our setbacks. It, it just happens. We see it all the time. People, somebody has a setback, and people give, give up. Peter had a setback in his life. The guy that Jesus said, you, I'm going to call you Rocky. Peter had a setback. Jesus told him, hey, there's going to be a time where you're going to deny me. And Peter is like, no way. All these other guys, maybe so, but not me. Not me, Lord, he said. Peter, Jesus said, yeah, you're going to deny me. Before the rooster crows, actually, you're going to deny me. Jesus is in a... In, a, in a, the time period where Jesus is, it gets arrested and he gets tried and he gets beaten. And he's, he is in the progression towards going to the cross. And Peter gets recognized by some of the people. And, he, and they said, weren't you with him? Weren't you with the Jesus guy? 
And Peter's like, not me? No, I don't even know the guy. Cusses. I, don't, I swear I don't even know the guy. And then the rooster crows. Peter realizes, oh my goodness. I did what he said I was going to do. Peter was remorseful and repentant. The difference between Peter and Judas is Judas went out and killed himself. Peter went out and repented. You see, your setbacks, they don't have to kill you. That's your choice. Setbacks don't have to kill you. That's your choice. I, I really believe that setbacks can be a set up for the, the future. Let me share a couple of things with you here. It, I believe that there are, there are four easy ways where, where setbacks can help you. They can be set ups for you. The first is that they can, they can help you to evaluate where you're headed. You get stopped in that on your way. They help you evaluate where you're headed. The second thing is they help you figure out what went wrong. The third way is, is that they help you, setbacks help you. They help you to define what is really important in life. The fourth thing is that setbacks help you design your future. Some of you may have been on a trajectory towards somebody else's goal, and you had a setback, and you realized, whoa, why was I even headed there? That's not what's most important to me. My dad tells a story about uh, marching around an uh, RV. It was in the days where people were marching around things and naming it and claiming it. So I thought, Lord, I, I'd like to have that RV over there. Should I stop and march around it? He said, I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, do you really want that? It looks like a lot of work. He said, I got to thinking about it. If I had to, to have that, I, I would drive it everywhere. I'd have to set it up. March would be complaining about something. And I thought, after a little while, he said, I thought, Lord, I, I don't want an RV. I do not. Please don't give me an RV. I don't want an RV. We all are headed towards dreams and plans that may not even be God's design for our lives. Let me tell you this about our church since we're talking about the church today. and That is this, that this church has also had its ups and downs, its victories and its setbacks. You're, you're sitting today in a church that is not perfect. We're good, but not perfect. If you consider yourself to be perfect, please directly exit the back of the room right here. You'll mess up our non-perfectness. Pastor James Greep started a church in this location. He had, he had this little piece of property here in the late 90s. He had started a church and he thought, you know what? We could move a double wide trailer out onto my lot and we could start having church in that trailer. It's set right out there where that foyer is. And they went along for a while and we started doing good and they built this sanctuary building here. The trailer's still set right there so they started entering from the side right over here. The foyer area was not there yet. After uh, a while here operating as Lakeside Assembly of God, Pastor Greep turned it over to David Martindale. David Martindale pastored here for uh, a few years and they moved the trailer and they built the foyer onto the front of the building here. And did good work, but couldn't sustain it. Couldn't grow the congregation to the point where it could sustain itself. So they closed the church down. There's another young guy that had a vision to start a church. His name was Mark Quick. He was a youth pastor over in Cyprus. And Mark Quick said, uh, I want to start a church in the the." Presbytery in the area said, well, we have this location where we need a church. We don't have anything there right now. We have a building. So Mark came over and they, they came over and looked at it and they said, it's, it's perfect. We'll take it. It was just a, a it had, didn't even have to be any concrete around it. It had that building and this building here. They pastored here for seven or eight years. And as time went along, they bought a couple of lots here behind us. And, and they grew and then couldn't sustain it and went back down. And the church closed a second time. That church was called New Beginnings. So it was Lakeside. Then it was New Beginnings. And then as we celebrated on our birthday back in August. 13 years ago there was a young man that came along. He was 23 years old and wanted to start a church. 
had, had some friends that, that came with him. And they started having church here as Northside. Uh, excuse me, as Northwood, sorry. As Northwood. They bought some, some equipment from Northside Church, which is over off of Kirkendall. And for a while, they moved out of this building trying to make it work bigger at a school. They tried everything that they could do to, to grow. They had good structure and good, good people, but couldn't get past a, a point there. Uh, five years ago, the pastor left. And it was, it was kind of turmoil. We were asked to come in. And it was uh, about 100 people at, at that point. And we've obviously grown since then. And, and God's done good things. And we've had our, our, our victories and we've had our setbacks. But I'm going to tell you something. This church is never closing again. It's not going down. It's never closing. But what it takes... It takes us all working towards the dream and vision that God not only has for this place, but has for you as in an individual. I believe that setups can set us, that setbacks can set us up for our future. There was a time period where Orville and Wilbur Wright were, uh, they were kind of homeschooled and they read everything. Their dad had books in the, in the house. And their dad was a pastor. That, and it was in a time period where they were fascinated with the idea of human, a human being able to get off of the ground, human flight. And the dad, the preacher, did not believe there was any way that was going to be possible. The preacher was completely against it. That is not possible. Uh, Wilbur had a setback in, during his high school years. He was playing hockey, and he had his teeth knocked out and really damaged his, his face right here. And he had a time period where that, that sent him into the house as a recluse, and he really started working and tinkering on mechanical things. And there was a time period where they read this book about how animals soar from one tree to another tree and how some animals are, are able to... Uh, that aren't supposed to fly actually kind of fly. There's flying fish. and They read this book and they thought and they dreamed, what if? What if? And then as you know the story, they were famously able to be the first people to rec recorded human flight. Because they didn't just dream, they did something about their dreams. And I want you to remember this today. God will never say to you, standing in heaven, if you make it, He will not say to you, great plans, great vision. He's going to say, well done. Well done. Because it's not enough to have a good vision. You have to do something about it. Today, I'm asking you to partner with God to grow as an individual and to see this church grow. For us to be able to reach more people in this community that need Jesus. They need Jesus. They need Jesus. You're, you're, you're driving by and you think, what's wrong with those people? They need Jesus. You're in your community and you see things and your, your neighbors and you go, what's wrong with these people? They need Jesus. That's what's wrong with them. Would you stand to your feet with me today? I want to pray with you. If you're here today, maybe there's just things in your life that are just not right between you and God. Is, is every head's bowed and every eye's closed today? His heads are bowed and eyes are closed today. You just need to get some things right with God. Would you slip up your hand right where you're at? Let me pray with you. So that's me, Pastor. I just need to get some things right. Thanks. 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 Let me pray for you. Would you just say this with me out loud across this place? Say, Jesus, I'm sorry for all of the wrong things that I've done. God, I need you to come into my life to clean me up. I thank you for hearing my prayer and for answering it. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I want to take a moment and I want us to pray for each other across this place. Would you just put your hand on the shoulder of someone near you there? If you're brand new here, we don't do this to, to embarrass anybody. You may want to pray. You may want to ask somebody around you there. Or you may want to tell them what you're praying and agreeing for there. Let me tell you this. Charles is in the hospital. Brother Charles Strader's in the hospital. We're, we're, uh, he is getting like fluid off of his body in the hospital. We're believing. We know God's working on that. We're continuing to believe and pray for him. I wanted to tell you this about my dad. Many of you guys have been praying for my dad. You may have seen us posted on Facebook uh, that he, he was diagnosed with cancer and it's his prostate and it's all across his bones and and um, they did radiation treatment and this week they came back and and he had had a, a, a cancer score a PSA score of 411 and now the cancer score a normal person you and I would have like a three a, a 3.0 his cancer level is 0 0.019 it's unrecognizable in this body you know we he, he, got, he got medical treatment and he got prayers from everywhere. So we believe, we believe in both medicine helping and God helping and making this happen. We have a healing kind of God. Let's pray for one another together today. Lord, for those in this place today, first I pray for those that have lost their dreams, God. I pray, God, that you will help them. to, to If you show them, Lord, what you want them to do, reveal the plans and the goals and the dreams that you have for them, Lord. Help them to put action towards those plans, those dreams, those goals. Lord, we pray for that first, that you instill with inside of each one of us a dream for our lives, a dream to do something partnering with you, something that matters, God. Make a difference. Lord, for the needs in this place, whether they be physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, relational, financial, whatever the need may be, God, we believe in you because you are a healing kind of God. You're a providing kind of God. Lord, you are able. You are the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. God, we pray that you make this church a lighthouse in this community. That we would be used by you to reach people. That they would come in and they would come to know you, God. That we will train people up and send people out, God. Use us, bless us, anoint us to do your work, Lord. Help us, God, to believe in you and your plan for our lives, Lord. We trust this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Whoa.